Uh, this morning, it's our fourth and final segment in this series that we've been working on for the last few weeks. The series is called, Who Are the People in Your Neighborhood? You know, one night there was uh, one couple that were in bed ready to go to sleep, and there was a dog outside that was barking and barking and barking. And this man that was wanting to go to sleep was getting increasingly upset. And, and uh, he said to his wife, he said, what is the matter with those people next door? Why can they not control their dog? For heaven's sake, it's 11 o'clock at night. And the dog continued to bark and bark and bark. And so finally, this guy picked up his phone off his night table, and he called the police, and he registered a complaint against the neighbor. And so sure enough, within moments, uh, a police cruiser pulled up, a couple of officers did a little investigating, and then they knocked on the door of the guy that made the complaint, and they said, sir, the dog that's barking is not in your neighbor's backyard, it's in your backyard. And he realized right then that he had forgotten to bring his dog in the house earlier in the evening. Everybody say, oops. Wouldn't be the first time that a neighbor was falsely accused, right? <laughs> Love your neighbors and their pets. Come on, before we dig into this session this morning, would you all repeat after me, I love God. Therefore, I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel, my pride and passion is to follow his example. Say, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Can you say amen? All right, well, this series has been based on the parable of the Good Samaritan, which we find in Luke chapter 10. But this morning, I am not going to reread that entire passage for the fourth Sunday in a row, but I do want to give you a quick overview. So basically one day a lawyer approached Jesus and said, what do I have to do in order to be good with God? And Jesus said, well, what does the word of God say? And the lawyer said, well, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and uh, Jesus said, well, there you go. You've answered your own question out of the scriptures. And, and, but the lawyer wanted to pursue it a little bit further. He said, well, who are the people in my neighborhood? And Jesus said, well, I'll answer your question with a story. One day there was a man who was walking from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and, and he was ambushed by a band of thugs who were wearing masks. <laughs> And then there was a priest who came along and, and he saw the condition that the man was in and he thought to himself, can't be late for church. So he hurried on his way and did not stop to help. And then a Levite, which is like an assistant priest, he came along and, and he saw the guy and he said, well, I'm not getting involved. Who knows? Maybe those bandits are still in the vicinity. So I'm getting out of here. And so he didn't stop to help either. And then what do you know? A Samaritan came down the road. Now, Samaritans and Jews, they have no dealings. They don't like each other. And so, so this is strange. But the Samaritan, of all people, he stopped to help. He showed mercy to this guy. And, and, uh, and so Jesus' listeners would have been very surprised to find, wow, a Samaritan stopped to help the Jew. But that's exactly what he did. He got him to the inn and Paid for all of his health care and the whole nine yards. Now, Jesus said to the lawyer, so which of the three guys that came along proved to be a neighbor to the victim of this crime? And the lawyer said, well, obviously it was, it was the foreigner who stopped to help. And Jesus said, bingo, so go and do likewise. Love your neighbor. Folks, this parable is a powerful picture of human relations. And, and so in this series, we've been... Uh, looking at four different levels of neighborliness. And number one was reaching out to people on a practical level, right? The Samaritans certainly did that. Bandages, medicine, transportation, accommodation, all expenses paid. It was very practical loving kindness that the Samaritan offered to this man. So we see reaching out to people on a practical level. Number two is reaching out to people on a personal level. So the parable says that the Samaritan felt pity toward the man. Remember, compassion is an emotional response to a person who is hurting. So getting involved with people on 
a level of the personal and the emotional involvement. Then number three, that was last Sunday, reaching out to people on the level of impartiality. That is, regardless of a person's, person's ethnicity or their economic status or their gender or any other social distinction, just willing to help a fellow human, right? Jesus' listeners, they, as I said, they, they were shocked to think that a Samaritan would show such care to a Jew, but that's exactly the way the story played out. So blessed is the person who has a genuine heart attitude of social equality toward his or her neighbor. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. All right, that brings us to this morning, this final session in the series. Level four, as you may have already guessed, is reaching out to people on a spiritual level. But the problem is we don't see that element in this parable. And there's a reason for that. You see, we don't see a spiritual exchange between these two men in the story. You know, something like, well, sir, do you know Jesus as your Savior? No, they did not converse on that level. Why not? Because this parable is pre-gospel. See, this this, this good Samaritan incident took place before Jesus went to the cross, before the resurrection, before there was such a, a thing as spreading the good news, before there was any such thing as, you know, sharing your faith, before there was conversion, before there was witnessing and engaging people in conversation about spiritual matters, helping somebody to understand their need of Jesus, their need of salvation. None of that was yet in play. Now, both of these men in the parable were, were likely worshipers of God, each in their own religious way, but it would be unheard of for a Jew or a Samaritan to try to persuade the other person to uh, adopt their belief system. That just wouldn't happen. And so we certainly see the love of God in this story, absolutely. But we don't see one man conversing with another man on a, a spiritually sensitive level. Well, friend, may I share with you how Jesus of Nazareth has made such a positive difference in my life? No, level four is not in this parable. So, may I switch gears this morning and suggest that we take this whole question of who are the people in your neighborhood and, and how can we reach out to them and engage them on a spiritual level? Let's take this over to the book of Acts, chapter 8. Because in the book of Acts, that's where we do find plenty of examples of post-cross. So after Jesus went to the cross and affected the good news of the gospel, then we do find in the book of Acts so many cases of people connecting with other people on a spiritual level, sharing the, you know, the, the life-changing power of Christ. In fact, the very first case recorded in Acts chapter 3. Now you understand in Acts chapter 2, that's when the New Testament church was born. Day of Pentecost, Peter gets up and preaches, and boom, 3,000 people at once turn their lives over to the Lord, and that was the beginning of our New Testament church. So that's Acts chapter 2. And then immediately following, in the beginning of Acts chapter 3, we see this account where Peter and John, they're heading up to the temple for the afternoon prayer meeting, and there's this guy sitting by one of the gates of the temple. He's crippled, right? And so he's begging for alms, right? He's soliciting donations. He's got his tin cup there. He's, 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 he's a beggar. And here comes Peter and John. And, and, you know, for them, it's an opportunity to help this guy on a practical level, right? Level number one, the practical. They could throw some coins in his cup. But that's not the way it reads. Peter... Peter skipped level one, and, and he went directly to level four. He said, sorry, buddy, I don't have any change on me, but I can do better than that for you. He took him by the hands and lifted him up, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And wow, boom, the guy instantaneously got his miracle. And so that day, he met Jesus, and he received uh, a healing in his legs. Absolutely fantastic Stuff. You know, one of my pastor friends in Halifax years ago preached from this third chapter of Acts, and he called his sermon, The Man Who Asked for Alms and Got Legs. <laughs> Very clever when you think about it. But uh, folks, can you see that there's different levels 
of interacting with people. Practical is good. Emotional is good. Impartial is very good. But the ultimate goal is to be able to somehow share our faith and talk about the Lord in such a way that we're really caring about a person's eternal destiny. You know, we can do this. This is not the job of others. This is the job of every born-again Christian. In this series, we've been talking about being missional. Everybody say missional. Yeah, to be missional, it means to, to bring up spiritual things and to hopefully influence people for the kingdom of God. You know, one Saturday afternoon, there was a pastor who was going door to door in the neighborhood trying to drum up some business for Sunday school. So he's talking to parents, you know, would you like to get your kids enrolled in the Sunday school in our local church here in the, in the neighborhood? And, and so he's, he's going along and in his travels, he meets up with a group of boys that are hanging out on one of the street corners and and he thinks, you know, I'm going to invite these boys to come to Sunday school. But he took a little bit different approach. Instead of just, you know, hitting them, you know, point blank with the question, hey, fellas, would you like to come to Sunday school? No, he came at it like this. He said, guys, would you like to go to heaven? One kid said, not me. The pastor looked at this fe fella and he said, young man, you don't want to go to heaven when you die? The kid said, oh, when I die, that's different. I thought you were getting up a crowd to go now. <laughs> don't rush me we all we all want to get there right but there is an appointed time folks in all of our interpersonal relationships with people we can be intentional about steering a conversation in a spiritual direction I mean who knows you might have the awesome privilege of introducing people to Jesus how about that come on how many of you can identify with me when I say that before we made that decision to believe and receive Jesus and become a full-fledged Christian, there's no level four going on in your life when you're a pre-Christian. You're not thinking and talking in terms of spiritual stuff, right? We don't, we don't, we don't you know, converse with one another about spiritual issues when, when we don't know Jesus. Unless maybe it has something to do with the occult or the paranormal. Or maybe if we have a, a religious traditional background, maybe we do speak about spiritual things on a religious level. You know, there are some people who would admittedly say, well, actually, Pastor, before I became a Christian, I talked a lot about Jesus, but it was mostly all profanity, Right? But now, now that we do know Jesus in a way where we speak respectfully of his name, now that we are spiritually reborn, that we've, you know, we've come to understand the, the reason why Jesus died on that cross, because he was taking the blame for us. He was, he was dealing with our sin factor so that he could let us off the hook, so that if we would make a personal decision to say, Jesus, I get it. You did that for me, and so please come into my life and just forgive my sin and and give me that fresh new start. I need to be spiritually reborn and, and get on with what you have for me in my new Christian life. When we make that personal decision, wow, now we get it. Now we understand that's who we are. That's what we are. We are spiritual-minded people. We certainly weren't before we were introduced to Jesus, but now we're spiritual-minded. We're spiritual-mouthed people. We talk about spiritual things freely. Come on, somebody say amen. I pray that it does not feel somehow awkward or uncomfortable for you to be able to discuss biblical issues. You know, especially when, when we're talking with fellow believers. You understand, for, for us as Christians to entertain conversation about spiritual stuff, this should be the most natural thing in life. This shouldn't be a forced thing. This should, this should just come freely from our spirit. Hey, let's, let's talk about the good things of God. I mean, there's all kinds of other good stuff that's not, not spiritual that we can talk about too, but, but, but certainly not to the exclusion of Christian things. We should be able to talk with one another about the good things of God, shouldn't we? You know, when I take couples through pre-marriage counseling, 
We do a session always on communication, and one of the things that I try to get across in that session is sort of similar to what we've been covering in this series, how there's, there's different levels of, of communication. And if a husband and wife are content to, to merely communicate on a practical level, you know, what's for supper? Are you going to drop the kids off at school tomorrow or shall I? You know, this is all practical stuff. And we have to deal in practical stuff. But surely we can get beyond the practical level and we can, we, we can, we can get to a level of communication as, as a husband and wife where we're talking on a personal, heart-to-heart, -heart, on an emotional level. Honey, what's troubling you? I can tell there's something bothering you. What's, what's going on? Do you want to talk? You know? We get, we get to you know, converse with one another on a level of, honey, what are your dreams? What are your fears? What is it that makes you tick? What's going on deep down inside of you? Talk to me. And so as husbands and wives, we can talk on a very deeply personal level, right? But we can, we can get beyond that and we can rise to an elite level of communication where we're able to talk as, as, as spice, right? That's the plural of spouse. We, we, we can talk with one another on a spiritual level. We talk about the things of God. We talk about what the Lord's doing in your life and my, and we can even pray together, communicating as Mr. and Mrs. on a spiritual level. And so we talk about these things because it should be the norm for a Christian couple and for Christians in general. It should be the norm for us to, to, to cut a path through life being able to talk about spiritual things. That shouldn't feel awkward coming out of our mouths. All right, let's check out this episode in Acts chapter 8. Finally, I got here. It took me a while. But Acts chapter 8, and, and, and this is the case of Philip reaching out to the Ethiopian eunuch. So we pick it up in, in verse 26. I think there's some valuable insights for us here about level 4 communication. So follow with me. Acts chapter 8 from verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopian. This guy is the finance minister of Ethiopia down in Africa. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Now, obviously there's been a, a phenomenal revival taking place in the Holy Land. Jesus has died, he's risen again, and now the good news is spreading across the map, and word has even reached Ethiopia that there's something amazing happening in the Middle East where the God of the Israelites has died and come alive again. And all sorts of miracles are being performed in his name. And so word of this came to this Ethiopian, and he traveled all the way down to Jerusalem to check it out and find out what's going on. And so he went there to worship. And then it says in verse 28, and on his way home, he's sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Now, apparently, he's, he's come and gone from Jerusalem, but he didn't get his questions sufficiently answered. He didn't come to know who Jesus is. And the Lord noticed that this guy from Ethiopia is getting away. <laughs> the Lord noticed out of the corner of his eye, hey, I better send one of my guys to chase him down and explain things more fully to him. Essentially, that's what's happening here. And so he's on his way home. He was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of Scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Now listen. There was no New Testament yet. That came about 50 years later on, toward the end of the first century. 
So at this point, all they're working with is the Old Testament scrolls. But imagine, this guy is wealthy. Somehow he's obtained a portion of Scripture. And of all the places in the Old Testament where he could be reading from, where is he reading? He's reading from the writings of the prophet Isaiah. Some have referred to it as the gospel according to Isaiah because Isaiah included so much prophecy about Jesus. And not only is he reading from the gospel according to Isaiah, guess which chapter of all 66 chapters? Now, at that time there weren't 66 chapters. The chapter and verse divisions were added later on for our convenience of Bible study. At that point, it was just all one big scroll. So whereabouts in that scroll do you suppose this curious guy was reading from? He was reading from the place that we now know as Isaiah 53. No less than the greatest chapter of them all in the writings of Isaiah. It's the chapter about the suffering lamb, which would be Jesus. And he comes to the end of this little portion of scripture. And in verse 34 it says, The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about here? Himself or someone else? Who, who is this sacrificial lamb? Philip says, oh, glad you asked that. I'd be happy to accommodate you with the answer. In verse 35, Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Is there any other hoops that I have to jump through? I believe in this Jesus that you've explained to me. Can I be baptized? <laughs> and so he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip ba baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again. But that eunuch went on his way, rejoicing all the way back to Ethiopia. He's got the joy of salvation. Now listen, before I point out a few things from this passage, I want you to think. Perhaps there's someone that you could be bearing in mind while I preach the rest of this message. Right? So who are the people in your neighborhood? Who are the people in your circle, your sphere of influence? I want you to think about it right now. People with whom you have to do. People that don't know Jesus yet. For whatever reason, you just have not been able to have that kind of conversation. You haven't brought up the subject of, of spiritual life with them. Who, who is that person? Or that couple? Or that friend? Or that co-worker? Or that neighbor? Or that customer? Or that client? Or that relative? Or that person that you really dislike? <laughs> Whoever it is. A person that you would just love to be able to talk to them about Jesus. But as of yet, you haven't taken that opportunity. See, there's, there's many of you in here right now. I'm sure there's a name or a face that comes to your mind when I throw that question out to you. Who are the people in your neighborhood? I want you to think about that person that comes to mind as I... As I kind of un unfold here for you some of these things that we can learn from Philip. Philip's going to show us how it's done here. And I, I hope that none of you are sitting there right now thinking, oh, pastor, now you got me thinking about that person that I really dislike. And I do not want to tell them about Jesus because that person doesn't deserve Jesus. <laughs> Please don't be sitting there thinking that. <laughs> You know, there was, there, there was two guys that really did not like each other. They were neighbors. They lived right next door to each other, and they, they never could say anything nice to each other. And one day there was a big, heavy snowfall, and the one guy, he got out there with his snowblower, and he blew all the snow off his driveway. And then he went over, and he blew all the snow off his neighbor's driveway, and the neighbor came out, and he said, Hey, what's going on? Why, why did you do that for me? If anything, I thought maybe you'd be blowing the snow from your driveway onto my driveway. They just did not like each other, right? And he, so he said, what gives? And the guy said, well, the reason I did that is because last Sunday in church, our pastor gave us a homework assignment. He said, this week I want you to go out and do something nice for someone that you just can't stand. <laughs> so there you go. Whether it's someone you like or someone that you intensely dislike, 
Come on, we can do this. All right, track with me here. I, I want to point out a few things from, from here in Acts chapter 8 in the passage that we just read. Because what was good for Philip is good for us. Come on, if it worked in Acts chapter 8, in Jesus' name, it'll still work right where we live. Come on, somebody say amen. All right, the first thing I want you to, to take note of, learn to detect the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Notice in verse 29, it says, The Spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. He's waiting for further instructions. Lord, you mean that luxury model chariot over there with the Ethiopian plates? Yeah, that's the one. Okay, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm on it. So Philip went over and he positioned himself for a conversation. Everybody say, position yourself. Yeah, that's a key. Position yourself. You'd be in the right place at the right time if you learn how to follow the leadings and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. You see, in theology, this is a fundamental New Testament truth. We call it the doctrine of the indwelling Holy Spirit. We could do a whole Bible study just on that subject alone this morning. But listen, when we make the decision to believe and receive Jesus, right then and there, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in us. He's like an internal guidance system. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Come on, that's us. Those who are God's children are led by the Holy Spirit. That's supposed to characterize who we are and how we do life from one day to the next. The Holy Spirit leading us. It's, it's, it's like this, this inward impression, an inner sense of knowing as the Holy Spirit says, do this, or uh, uh, don't do that. You know, go here. Oh, don't go there. You know you have no business going there. Don't go there. That's trouble. You know, say this or don't say that. So the Holy Spirit leads us. Sometimes it's, it's like a thought that crosses your mind, you know. You ought to give so-and-so a call. Don't wait. Give them a call. You might be amazed to, to discover that that's exactly what that person needed right then. They were going through a time. They were discouraged. Oh, I'm so glad you called because you were prompted by the Holy Spirit. That's, that's how the Holy Spirit will work in us. He, he will check us when, when we need to be checked and not, 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 not go further, not do that. Or, or He will sometimes convict us when we already went a little bit too far. Say, hey, is that you need to go to that person and apologize. You need to make this right. Ever felt that kind of conviction of the Holy Spirit? Sometimes he'll do just the opposite. You've done right, and he will commend you. Pastor Vince used to call that the attaboys of the Holy Spirit, or the girl. As the Holy Spirit kind of pats you on the back, it's just good for you. That was the right thing to do. That was the honest thing to do. Learning to live by the promptings, the leading, the voice, of the Holy Spirit within. And one of the ways that He will lead us is this whole area of sharing our faith with others. But Pastor Brian, how, how do you know how to, how to detect that voice? Well, I think it's one of those areas that, as they say, it's better caught than taught. Better felt than tell. You know, it's the best kind of training is on-the-job training. You just get out there among people and, and, and you, you, you just say, Lord, help me. Help me to, 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 to have my ear, my inner ear, tuned to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, teach us to be sensitive to your voice, sensitive to the needs of people around us. All right, the second thing we, we can learn from Philip is this. Never presuppose that a person is not interested in hearing what you have to say on a spiritual level. It's so easy to cop out, isn't it? <laughs> You know, just to say to ourselves, oh, well, they, they probably would just flatly refuse. They'd probably be offended if I tried to invite them to come to my church. What, are you holier than thou? Why, why are you inviting me to your church? <laughs> Don't think that way. Listen, Philip did not walk over to that chariot thinking to himself, well, this guy is a big shot from down in Ethiopia. He's probably not interested. He, he'll probably just say, no, I've got my own God, thank you. No, Philip wasn't thinking that. Philip was missional to the bone. If anything, he's probably thinking, wow, this guy's from Ethiopia, man. If I share the Lord with him, he could take that message of the good news back with him and share it with all of his countrymen. This could be massive. <laughs> That's probably more like 
how Philip was thinking. No, in that 30th verse, it says Philip ran over to the chariot. Holy Spirit said, go over and stay near that chariot. Philip ran to the chariot. If you study the original Greek New Testament and, and find out what the meaning of that word ran, you know what that word ran means? Ran. <laughs> he ran to that chariot. Listen, if the Lord prompts you to go and talk to somebody, if you just kind of slowly saunter over there, it might be an indication that you're trying to talk yourself out of it or maybe trying to talk the Lord out of it. Lord, I don't know if this is a good idea. That person, I know that person. Lord, they've got a very non-Christian lifestyle. I don't think they would be interested. The Lord says, that's exactly why I want you to share with them so that I can change them. <laughs> if you just saunter over slowly, it might mean you're trying to make some excuses. But if you run to that opportunity, that's a good sign, isn't it? This guy from Ethiopia, he was interested. Listen, he traveled a long way to get his questions answered. The guy's curious. He's got a spiritual void, just like many people around us in 2021. Yeah, this guy's interested, all right. He's reading the scriptures. He's searching. There's people in your circle, people in your neighborhood that are searching, and they just need somebody to explain some things to them. Folks, don't ever assume that a person is not interested in what you're selling. All right, you still got that person in your mind? Keep thinking about them. The third thing that we need to learn is this. To engage a person on a spiritual level will require some degree of forthrightness. Everybody say forthrightness. In other words, a little, a little boldness comes in handy, a little courage. To go ahead and break the ice to initiate a conversation. Or maybe it's not even a, a whole big conversation. Maybe it's just slipping in a remark here or there. That can be a little bit of a hook for somebody to say, Oh, does that mean, are you one of those Christians? Tell me more. This is something I've been curious about. So Whether it's a conversation or, or even if it's, it's just you know, a, a, a remark here or there, along the way. A little forthrightness. To go ahead and say it. In verse 30, Philip approaches this man and he says, excuse me, sir, I couldn't help but eavesdrop. I mean, I couldn't help but <laughs> overhear that you're reading from the Scriptures. Do you understand what you're reading? Yeah, Philip just went for it. Just stepped out in fearlessness. Excuse me, sir. May I be of assistance? Listen, it's, it's not all that scary. Especially if it's a person that you already know. It's kind of like using a spiritual pickup line. You know, somebody might be, like we talked about a couple of Sundays ago, maybe somebody is venting some sort of frustration, some sort of discouragement about a, a circumstance in their life, and they kind of dump that out to you, and, and you're thinking, oh man, i got to seize this moment. This is my opportunity. Okay, no fear. No fear. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get it out there. And, and so you say something like, well, can I share with you something that's worked for me? Oh, please do, because what's, wor what's going on in my life is not working for me. And that's when you get to say something about Jesus. Or have you ever used this line? Do you have a good church that you and your family attend? <laughs> Oh, I sense an invitation come. What's the worst that can happen? No thanks. Right? That's not too bad. Nobody's going to crucify you. At least probably not. <laughs> you see, we mustn't be bound by fear. Got to exercise some forthrightness. Now listen, forthrightness is not to be mistaken for overly aggressive. Please don't hit somebody over the head with a Bible. We call that conversion by concussion. Okay, that's not good. I don't recommend that. But folks, listen carefully. Do you know how most of us in this room got here? It's because somewhere along the way, somebody cared enough and somebody dared enough to bring up the subject of faith with us. Yeah, and, and, and it kind of made perfect sense to us. And what do you know? Here we are. Here we are. Somebody reached out to us to speak to us on a spiritual level. 
And the least that we could do now is be open to reach out to somebody else and speak to them on level four as well. So when you find yourself in a situation where you're thinking, well, I know I should try to get a word in for the Lord here in the, you know, with this person, go for it. Don't hold back. Go for it. Take the lid off that can. Have that friendly discussion. It's amazing what kind of eternal results there could be. Okay, fourth thing that I notice here in Acts chapter 8 is this. If you want to reach out to someone on a spiritual level, please realize that very likely that person is spiritually ignorant. I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean that they probably have very limited understanding of spiritual truth. Have you noticed this? The generation that we're currently living in has a higher rate of biblical illiteracy than any generation that's gone before us since the Word of God came into play. Biblical illiteracy means people have no idea, no clue what's going on when it comes to what the Bible says. So much illiteracy in our day. In verse 30 and 31, Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch said, well, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? Everybody say, explain. That's the role of a Christian, to do some explaining. Verse 34, after they read this passage, the, 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 the eunuch said, well, I, I don't get it. Is the prophet referring to himself or somebody else? Now, you and I, from our vantage point, we clearly understand. Wow, that's Isaiah 53. He's talking about the sacrificial lamb. That would be Jesus. Okay, we understand that. We didn't always understand that. But now that we're Christians, we clearly know who the central figure is there in Isaiah 53. But this guy said, well, wait, is Isaiah talking about himself when he talks about this lamb that went to the slaughter and just went silently? Is that Isaiah or is that somebody else? Wow. Philip's like, hey, glad you asked. Let me explain. Folks, most people these days do not understand the simple terms of the gospel. You know, they, a lot of people have no church background whatsoever or else maybe they have a very religious church background and, and the idea of being born again is a foreign concept to them. You know, most people are stuck in this misconception. Well, if there is a heaven, I'm pretty sure I'll, I'll probably end up there if I live a fairly decent life. You know, if my, if my merits outweigh my demerits, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, I'm kind of as good as the next guy, I'll end up in heaven, I think. Wow, nothing could be further from New Testament truth. It's not based on merits or demerits. It's based on faith in what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. Come on, somebody say amen. You know, some people think that the epistles are the wives of the apostles. <laughs> That's not true. The epistles are letters written by the apostle Paul, right? There's one guy who thought that Dan and Beersheba were husband and wife. Getting some blank stares here, you see. It's true. <laughs> some of you are saying, okay, well, if they weren't husband and wife, then who were they? <laughs> it's not who were they. <laughs> what were they? Dan and Beersheba. They are the northernmost and southernmost dots on the map of Israel. In ancient Israel, they had this saying, from Dan to Beersheba. We would say from Victoria to St. John's. In other words, across the whole land, from Dan to Beersheba. <laughs> they were not married. <laughs> okay. There was one, one gentleman that went into a jewelry store one day in Denver, Colorado. and He said to the young man behind the counter, just a kid, he's just a teenager. And, and this gentleman said, do you have any cross necklaces? And, and, and this young guy said, oh, yes, we do. Right over here, sir. Come, come over here, I'll show you. Would you like a plain one or one with a little man on it? <laughs> a little man? That's not a little man. That's Jesus. But you see how that story is so indicative of, of the spiritual ignorance that we're dealing with in our day. That's, that's kind of what we're up against. And So if you want to relate to somebody on level four, go slowly and be prepared to fill in the blanks and be patient and work with somebody who doesn't know the first thing about Bible truth. But they're open. All right, folks, there is a fifth point that we can learn from Philip very quickly, it's this. The whole object of the game is to win the opportunity to 
introduce people to Jesus. To Jesus. Yeah, verse 35, it says, Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told the eunuch the good news about Jesus. Come on, just turn to your neighbor right now and say, It's all about Jesus. Yeah, exactly. If we try to bring up the subject of God or, you know, spirituality, that, that's very broad. There's so many tangents, tangents that a, a conversation can go off in when you talk about, well, do you believe in God? <laughs> or well, how do you feel about spirituality? Oh, man, that can go in so many misguided rabbit trails. But if we can stay focused on the person of Jesus, now we're getting somewhere. That's what it's all about. How do you feel about Jesus? See, it's not just about letting your light shine and being a really nice person, as good as that is. But hear me well, at some point, if there's a person that you care about and you really do want to reach out in a significant way that can be really helpful to that person, at some point along the way, it's not just about being a really nice person toward them and hoping that they will catch on, that that means, oh, this person is a Christian, I should, I should want to be a Christian too. It's good. Let your light shine. Yeah, let them see what a caring Samaritan you are. But at some point along the way, we have to articulate our faith. We have to clearly spell it out. It's all about Jesus. There was a Christian and a non-Christian who worked alongside of each other for many months. One day, the non-Christian turned to his work partner and he said, Ronnie, I've noticed there's something different about you. And right then, Ronnie is thinking, oh, finally, finally, he has clued into the fact that, that I'm a Christian. <laughs> but that's not, that's not how it went. <laughs> the guy said, Ronnie, I, I've noticed there's something different about you. Are you a vegetarian? <laughs> no, I'm not a vegetable-tarian. I'm a Christian. <laughs> oh. You're a Christian. Well, why didn't you say so? Why didn't you say so? That's the million-dollar question right there, my friends. Why didn't you say so? I wonder who the people are in your neighborhood or mine that are still wondering. They're still waiting for us to say so. Psalm 107, verse 2, it says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yeah, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. One of the other translations put this, puts it this way. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Speak out. Come on, would you stand with me this morning? I ask you one more time. Who are the people in your neighborhood? Lord, help us to be intentional about being missional. As I said before, that's how we all got here. And in Jesus' name, there are many others that could also find their place in the family of God. Why? Because folks like you and I were willing to reach out and engage people on a spiritual level of friendship, a spiritual level of conversation. It's not difficult, particularly with the grace and help of God working in us and through us. So come on, as we stand before the Lord this morning. Before we dismiss and go home and shovel some snow, let's, let's make a decision. Let's make a firm decision. Come on, with the help of the Lord, the Holy Spirit leading us, we can be men and women who are increasingly missional. People that really care about the spiritual need of others around. And so we can reach out and we can engage them. Oh my goodness, there's so much good that can come out of this. So as you stand before the Lord this morning, come on, just yield yourself to the Holy Spirit right now. I invite all of us to make a decision. Just right where you are, you're standing at the altar. The entire sanctuary is an altar right now. Let's just make a decision. Jesus, I choose to reach out to that individual that's on my mind. That person I've known for a long time, Lord, I should really be a witness to them, but for some reason I've held back. I haven't done it. 
Lord, help me to find just the right opportunity. Father, in Jesus' name, this morning I pray that there would be many, many Holy Spirit-ordained moments when we would be in the company of some person and we'd just be feeling right then, Holy Spirit, just rise up big inside of us. Just prompt us, unmistakably prompt us right then to say, go ahead and, and share Jesus with this person. Go ahead and say something that represents your biblical conviction. Do it now. Father, I pray that in those moments we will not resist, but that we will be responsive to your spirit. We will be responsive to the need of a person that we're looking at. Lord Jesus, that we will be obedient and that there will be just a beautiful power of the Holy Spirit unleashed in those moments. We choose to obey this message that we've just received this morning. We're going to take this ball and run with it, Lord. I declare your blessing upon us all for this purpose. Come on, folks. Would you just remain in prayer for just another moment? Because before I officially dismiss you from church today, I would like to lead us in that simple prayer of faith. You know the one. We do it every Sunday morning. But always there's someone in the house that needs to truly commit their life to Christ. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, in this moment of commitment, if you're here and you know, Pastor, I need to really give my life over to Jesus. I need, I need to commit my life to Christ for now and forever. Just raise your hand wherever you are. Simple show of hands. If you know that you need to really submit yourself to Jesus, that He'll be your Savior and He'll be your Lord, just wave at me wherever you are until I can see your hand and you can put it down. In a moment, we're all going to pray this simple prayer of faith together. Yes, I see your hand here in the center. Thank you. You can put it down. Are there others? Who else? This is your day to say, oh God, count me in to the family of God. I'm not living another day in my life without saying, Jesus, from here on out, I'm running with you. Anybody else? Before we all pray together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, church. Let's pray this prayer, whether it's the first time or whether you've prayed this many times. Come on, let it be fresh right now. Just reaffirm your faith in Jesus. Let's pray this. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name. I give my life over to you for your holy purposes. Oh, God, use me to influence others for the kingdom. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I know it. I believe you died on that cross. You rose from the grave to champion the cause of a brand new life for me. Lord, forgive me for all I've ever done wrong. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And help me to live as a missional Christian. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. As a church, our desire is that we always bring encouragement. So if today's message was encouraging to you, you can drop us a line and let us know. Or if you have any prayer requests, we'd love to hear from you. You can stay connected to what's happening at Gateway by subscribing right here or following our social media accounts. Hey, if you want to support our vision and help us keep moving church forward, there's two easy ways you can give. You can text to give or give online. That's all I got for you, so have a great week and we'll see you again next time.